Again, welcome to everyone in the room. As you can see, we do have the chat up on this screen behind us so you can see what the online participants are saying. If you want to log in and join and ask a question, that way you can. But during the Q&A, I will make sure that I take questions online and in the room. So for those of you in the room, don't worry, you can ask your questions at that time as well. So today is the sixth in a series of sessions at HMPW on accountability to affected populations being run by the IASC task force on AAP, as well as the participation revolution to bring about the participation revolution envisaged in the grand bargain. It's being done also in coordination with PHAP. So thank you to PHAP for hosting. This is kind of the culmination of the series, I think, because we're now really, we've had six, five already sessions. The first one was on every contact counts, intentional accountability through the program cycle. So how every individual humanitarian worker has a role to play in affected, uh, accountability to affected populations in every encounter that they have with a person who's been affected by crisis. The second session was around accountability to affected populations and humanitarian data responsibility and how data individuals and the AAP world can be working together much more to be able to understand what the needs of the population are, to get help with the feedback, to make sure that we're really using all that information and data that is being gathered to ensure that decision makers are able to take decisions in a timely manner. The third session was about leveraging social sciences for community engagement in humanitarian action. So very much looking at some of the research sides to be able to better understand what the needs are of a population, what they're saying their needs are, so that we're able to come back and really provide what people are asking for and what they need. The fourth session was on empowering frontline staff to deliver accountable and locally driven humanitarian assistance. A little bit like linking that point with every contact counts. Frontline staff are the ones who are meeting individuals affected by crisis on a daily basis. So they will often have a great deal of information about the needs, the desires, what capacities the population has. But how do we make sure that we're really involving frontline staff in delivering aid and making decisions around what goes into a project proposal? How are they able to feed back to communities when decisions are taken? And how can they also influence decision makers to make sure that changes can come about in the program that in the programs that are being delivered? And then last week, we the last session we had last week was the launch or the relaunch actually of the accountability and inclusion help desk and the portal, which is a great opportunity for those working on accountability to affected populations to reach out with any technical questions, to be able to share resources such as guidelines, tools, uh, trainings, whatever it may be, and to really be able to build a better community of practice around accountability to affected populations. And that was actually the result of a call from last year's HNPW AAP sessions to have some sort of a help desk. So it's been great to see that a year on that has come to fruition. And now today's session is very much about what do we need to change? We've been talking about accountability to affected populations for more than a couple of decades now. And we've seen a lot of shifts of way that organizations operate, that the ways of working are changing, but we haven't necessarily gotten to fulfilling the promise of accountability to affected populations all the time. We make lots of changes, we've seen lots of progress, but we haven't quite uh, made it happen in reality all the time. So there's still work that we need to do to be able to make sure that we're really listening to people, putting that, what we hear into action in terms of how it affects our programming and making sure that we are translating our commitments to accountability to affected populations into reality. So today we're going to be exploring a review of some of the donor commitments on AAP and progress made against them. We'll be looking at some of the perspectives from people affected by crisis and what they think needs to change. And then we're going to be looking at examples from three countries as well in terms of what is being done and works well in terms of putting accountability to affected populations into practice. But overall, we want to see what are some of those changes that we can make now to put those accountability commitments to people in crisis into practice. So I'm going to introduce our panelists before I turn to them. We're going to have first Tanya Wood to my left, who is executive director of the CHS Alliance and 
co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Task Force on Accountability to Affected Populations. Then we have accountability. That's right, right? Thank you. <laughs> so many acronyms. <laughs> to my right, we've got Andy Featherstone, who is a humanitarian consultant and wrote the report on the donor um, commitments. So he'll be talking to us about that. We have Meg Sattler, who is the CEO of Ground Truth Solutions up above me there. Um, and Gwen is going to be talking to us about some of the perceptions of populations that Ground Truth Solutions has gathered over the years. We then have Hasna Pradetias, or TS, who is Community Engagement and Accountability Senior Officer at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, or IFRC, in Indonesia. We have Jerry Grant Sanioli, who is Comprehensive Refugee Response Associate in UNHCR Uganda. And both TS and Jerry are going to be talking to us about some good practices around AAP that will be featured in a forthcoming task force document on good practices. And last but not least, we have Gwyn Lewis, who is the UN resident coordinator in Bangladesh, who will be talking to us about how AAP is being put into practice in Bangladesh, but also reflecting a little bit from the days when she and I were working on AAP commitments in the Interagency Standing Committee. So Gwen's going to bring a bit of a, a historical perspective on where we come from and how we're doing. So with that, let me, oh, sorry, I'm also just going to say, please, to the panelists who are online, feel free to answer some of the questions and answers. You can type live answers in case we don't get to all of them. And those who are already introducing yourselves in the chat, thank you very much. I see we've got lots of participants from all over the globe. So thank you for joining us. Tanya, with that, I'm going to turn to you, please. Fantastic. Thank you, Manisha. Welcome, everybody. Great to see all of you in the room here in Geneva, as well as the many of you who've joined us online. So looking around here in the room that we have, we have a lot of people here in Geneva, and I can see a lot of names that are familiar online who've been engaged, as Manisha just mentioned, this history, many of you have been trying to bring about change in NA AAP for many years now and trying to confront this question around what needs to change to bring about greater accountability. And someone in this room here earlier today said, what keeps you inspired for keeping pushing on this? Where's the inspiration? Because we've been trying to do this for a long time. And what gives me inspiration, and I know it gives the sort of those of us who work on the uh, ISC task force the same inspiration, because we talk about it often, is this, that there really is this reckoning now that AAP, accountability to the people we serve, is no longer this sort of niche idea, this add-on, this thing that happens at the program level, the kind of niche people who like to talk and the social workers. It's a fundamental aspect of not only doing the morally right thing to put people's dignity and their agency at the center, but also that it really is fundamental to doing effective programming. And so we're starting to see that this sort of idea that it isn't just an add-on or an additional part, but fundamental to our work, and that it really requires this concerted collective uh, push for a system-wide change. And it's this system-wide change that is the basics of the work of the Interagency Standing Committee Task Force around our work on accountability to affected people. And we focus on three areas that we feel will bring about this system change. The leadership to be able to push for this, inclusivity as being the way of being able to bring about this change, and also that we have to be able to influence those who do hold the current power, as in how do we resource this and the role of the donors. So it's fantastic, I think, in this session today that we're going to hear from three critical pieces of, of work that are at the heart of uh, the work of the task force. One is how do we do more to listen and respond to the people's views themselves? And it's going to be fantastic, I know, to listen to the excellent work of Ground Truth Solutions, which will always gives us that sobering reality of how much more work there is to do and how we're only still at the start of, of that journey. 
Then we're going to hear some really good highlights um, from a series that, that OCHA has been leading on around really connecting to bringing about the enablers and the challengers with some case studies to bring about the reality of what this does take to make those changes at the, at the country level. And of course, we're really pleased that we have Andy with us, who's just written a, a really excellent review, uh, which looks at how we can get the donors to support collective accountability. And there are some, for those of you who are in Geneva, there's some hard copies in the room, and we'll be putting it out on online as, as well. So I think these different perspectives will show some of the huge challenges that we have to break down the uh, barriers to more accountability to affected people. But I do feel there is this, and we see it by how many are here, how many are joining, that there is this real committed push that we can do things differently and we can bring about that change. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Tanya. And I think I, those three things that you said, leadership, inclusivity, and how do we influence those who hold power are where we really need to make some of those bigger changes to be able to really get to that point of being accountable to those affected by crisis. Andy, so as Tanya mentioned, you have just finished the report on supporting donors' responsibility for greater accountability to people in crisis, a review of donor AAP commitments, requirements, and recommendations. Tell us a little bit about the main findings and recommendations from your study, Andy, and I will change the slides for you. So let me know when you want me to. Just give, they'll go up in a second and we will start. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Manisha, Tanya, uh, and folks here. It is fantastic to see so many people um, here today and a, a huge number of people online as well. So, and fantastic to have an opportunity to talk about something that has been a passion of mine and is something that's so important um, for the humanitarian system, obviously. And really, as, as Manisha and Tanya have said, where this has come from really is a felt desire within the system for the longest time now but really something that is beginning to, to gain um, traction from being something that we talked about a lot to something that um, was occupying the policy space to now an issue that really is beginning to claim back some ground, albeit with a lot of work still to do. And so, as Manisha said, the piece of work that I did was really looking at three things. Firstly, trying to get a sense of where, um, the, where research and evaluation was pushing donors in terms of the contribution they can make to strengthening accountability to affected populations. Secondly, trying to understand what commitments donors have. Um, so fundamentally, that's going to drive the way they work. And thirdly, trying to understand what requirements they have of their funded partners. So really trying to understand kind of what, they, what their skin, skin is in the game, as it were. So if we start on the, on the next page, on the first page of the... Uh, um, looking at the AAP landscape. And as I said, the feeling really is that whilst there has been a lot of ground, there's a lot of ground still to cover, there is a lot that has been done. So we are starting to see a groundswell of, of change. So definitions and commitments are in place. Um, as Tanya said, um, not only is it the right thing to do, but AAP um, also contributes significantly um, to program effectiveness. We know that the evidence is there. Um, but yet practice lags so far um, behind where policy is. And so, again, sort of with the research beginning to look at what's been achieved over the last few, um, last few years, um, we've always been quite clear about the individual agency accountability from donors to agencies to affected people. But where practice has been strengthened in the last couple of years really is, is in, in conceptualising, I suppose, um, collective um, accountability, AAP um, practice, um, and having clear commitments in place and beginning to um, work across different contexts in trying to operationalise that. So we do have a groundswell of practice. The policies are there behind it. And things are, the situation is beginning to change. And there's evidence in a number of different contexts around how collective AAP is starting to work. So if we go on to the next slide, Manisha. Thank you. So looking at the, the sort of first of those three tasks. So what is it that if evaluations and research and reports are saying in terms of how donors can 
contribute to to this shift in 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 strengthening sort of practical collective AP? Well, the first thing that comes out very strongly is the need for flexible funding. Um, and this was one of the recommendations that came out in the greatest number of reports I looked at. There was 80 or so reports which focused on donor AAP practice. Um, and this was the single most um, uh, frequent finding. So important need both to have flexible funding for collective AAP activities. And we know that the, um, the framework looks across the humanitarian program cycle at a basket of activities to strengthen um, and account for action of humanitarian agencies to people. Um, but what's coming out of research is that there's a risk that donors sometimes cherry pick or that the full basket isn't funded. And of course, as far as accountability goes, it's only as strong as, as actually achieving. Accountability isn't something you can pick and choose. It, it works across the whole um, of the system and across the whole of a programme cycle. Secondly, the thorny issue around adapting assistance to feedback. On the one hand, we say, well, um, if we are to be um, demand driven, uh, if we are to, to be able to listen to people, then obviously we need to change programmes. We need to be responsive to that. And there is a, a sort of vexed issue over the extent to which donors are sufficiently flexible and actually allow agencies to come back and say, well, hang on a minute, we need to make changes to be relevant. Um, so that was a, a, another important issue around flexible funding. Um, secondly, predictable funding. Um, again, sort of looking at there is now a clear proposition around what collective AAP looks like. Um, let's not pick and choose. There needs to be predictable funding throughout a time period of a response so that there is a level of assurance that those um, services can be provided. So across the, the programme cycle. Um, important now that there is policies in place to support leadership um, and participation of local actors. Localization is, is, a, is a significant issue during this week, a number of sessions on it. We know that there is work to do to strengthen inclusion of local actors, to strengthen capacity, but I think even more so to ensure they're front and centre and leading um, in this accountability space. Um, and that requires funding, that requires capacity, that requires commitment, and there is work that donors can do to support that. Um, and linked sort of still on the issue of capacity, um, if we know that there is a need to strengthen and support um, collective AAP across humanitarian situations, then as part of, as in addition to local capacity, then there needs to be surge capacity um, to support that when there's a need, when there's an upsurge or a spike um, in crises um, to ensure that the humanitarian system can um, deliver that effectively. Um, there's a basket of recommendations on incentivization. So um, that's both looking at carrots and sticks, money for AAP, but also potentially sanctions for AAP or pushing um, agencies to ensure that when they are presenting proposals that they do have complaints and feedback mechanisms in place or that they can evidence or demonstrate the fact that it is rooted in people's felt needs. Um, so there's some interesting issues around um, donors' use of carrots and sticks, I guess, to incentivize agency participation in AAP. And then finally, a whole basket of issues around um, needing to ensure it's not just focused on um, the response, but obviously accountability um, also needs to go before response and long after it as well. So AAP funding across the nexus, using soft power as well as hard power, so using donor influence um, to help strengthen leadership, um, and to um, encourage um, the use and rollout of collective AAP um, guidance. And finally, the important need, and this is what the, the task force is looking at now, um, to really communicate to donors um, what agencies want them to do. So that's the sort of key basket of recommendations. Thank you. Are you done? Yeah. Um, so in terms of what, what actions donors are taking, so this is around the commitments and the requirements. Um, and so without going into too much detail here, I think it's important to say there were basically three um, groups here. So tier one, um, donors um, sort of committed to the Good Humanitarian Donorship Initiative, the Grand Bargain Commitments, very sort of clear acknowledgement and understanding of that. 
and really able in terms of their requirements for funded partners. Um, they may have requirements for agencies to um, uh, be members of the CHS, to have an AAP plan, indicators, reporting, quite significant um, set of requirements. And then if you go down, and but that was just a few, a small number um, of donors, so maybe three, four, five. The vast majority are in tier two, which is much, um, I suppose, looser really in terms of commitments um, and the requirements. And then tier three, which is really quite silent on AAP. So to give a sense of the different range of donors and their commitments and requirements. And then the next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, a number of, of dilemmas, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. So the dilemma of localization on the one hand, sort of raising the bar um, in terms of AAP, on the other, acknowledging that already we're behind the curve in terms of um, supporting and funding um, um, uh, local actors. Dilemma of earmarking on the one hand, requesting money for AAP, um, but on the other hand, trying to address earmarking and reduce earmarking, similar with increasing reporting requirements. If you use, um, if you do, if there is an expectation from donors of um, having additional reporting um, on AAP, then that goes against um, uh, a, a sort of push around trying to reduce that. Um, the difficulties around um, encouraging collective. AAP in a competitive system. Um, issues around double dipping. So on the one hand, donors saying to agents as well, we give you a lot of um, um, unrestricted funding. And so if it's important, then it's Im important that you prioritize that and use your unrestricted funding for that, um, rather than coming back and asking for additional funding. Um, some important evidence gaps that still needed to be filled, um, particularly around this issue of flexibility a question around um, whether, um, on the one hand, agencies are asking sufficiently clearly about the need for flexibility, so whether it's an agency problem of self-censorship or whether it's a donor problem of actually saying, sorry, we're not flexible, we can't, we can't meet this need. Um, donors um, wanting to avoid themselves a tick box approach. So whilst on the one hand, there is a push to say, or could donors perhaps um, incentivize AAP? Could they use um, greater sanctions to really push uh, and strengthen collective AAP? Um, donors themselves will say, well, actually, we don't have the capacity to do more than we're doing at the moment. Um, we need to be very careful that we don't just end up doing lip service to AAP because that's as, as big a problem um, uh, in a way, it's a bigger problem to do lip service than, than, than the sort of current situation. Um, the penultimate bullet to recognise that donors have different AAP niches. They have different interests. Um, they have different aspects and areas that they will fund. So from a collective AAP perspective, we could be smarter around uh, identifying which donors would potentially fund different aspects of AAP. And finally, um, and I think it's important for the, the bilaterals and some of the multilaterals sort of push back and say, well, hang on a minute. It's not just about us. It's also about intermediaries um, needing to practice what they preach. So this is both about, you know, the bilaterals, the institutional donors, but also about intermediaries. And on the final slide, I would say the key message to sort of try and encapsulate it and aware that I am well over time now is really to say, the key thing is is around is, is the sort of the, the orange um, arrow at the bottom, really to clarify and communicate the linkage between individual AAP, collective AAP, but most importantly to to kind of use this sort of knowledge and understanding of the areas and aspects where donors are on the front foot and are funding collective AAP, and kind of where they where they lack clarity. Um, to, 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 sort of, to, to offer a, a much stronger and clearer message um, around what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. And two quick follow-up questions for you. Based on the study and what you've seen and all your experience in the humanitarian world, what's the most important change that humanitarian agencies need to make in order to deliver on their accountability commitments 
to affected people. And I'm going to throw the other one in. And what should the role of donors be in prompting that change? On the humanitarian agencies, it really still is this shift that still needs to happen from um, having um, a supply-driven system to fundamentally changing that to a demand-driven system. And we're beginning to have a sense of what the roadmap might be to get there. And I think a little bit later on, we'll be discussing the, the, the ERC's flagship initiative, and that might help us kind of push us on a bit further. But that's still a fundamental issue from an agency perspective. From a donor perspective, I think as much as anything else, what was quite interesting that came out of this is as much that the collective humanitarian system is now much is, is now much clearer about how it can strengthen collective AAP at a system level. Um, it actually almost demands that donors are better at working together and better at coordinating with each other and are clearer in terms of um, how they will work together to help the system realize the aspirations and ambitions that it has. Super. Thanks very much. And for those of you who haven't yet read Andy's study, definitely do read it and it will be online shortly. And there was a question in the chat around, uh, did the study identify donors per tier? And at least in the draft I looked at, it did not, did it? Uh, we have some ideas of the donors in the different tiers, yes. <laughs> but it's not it's not listed in the study. It wasn't necessarily helpful to list it in the study. Exactly. No. I figured that would be the case. Thank you so much, Andy. I am going to turn to you now, Meg. And I know it's very late, early in the morning, actually, or late at night, I think, where you are. So thank you for joining us online. So Meg is, as I mentioned before, the CEO of Ground Truth Solutions. And Meg, I imagine that a lot of the data that Ground Truth Solutions uh, is holding is easy to brush aside as being just too hard to act on. The system's got a lot of pressure. We just can't give people what they want all the time. So how do you navigate those conversations with humanitarians at various levels? And what does that mean for global policy? Thanks, Manisha. And hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm not there in person. Um, you'll have to deal with my midnight face. Um, I think that's a really interesting question and also particularly now um, I've been in quite a number of conversations recently where the number one topic running through everything seems to be prioritization, you know, the need to sort of do more with less, make tougher decisions. Um, and so I think that's going to cloud probably what I'll say today, but I also think it's quite a good challenge to us as AAP advocates. Um, to make sure that we're singing from the right song sheet as people start cutting things as those conversations progress. Um, GTS conducted our first global analysis last year. I'm not going to present it all just in the name of time. Um, the report author Elise is in the room there in Geneva if anyone wants to grab her afterwards and we're also happy to follow up bilaterally. Um, but the report basically pulled together community perception data from 10 or so countries last year and was discussed by the IESC principals in November. Um, we often get told that our data is always very negative and depressing, and I'm not going to disappoint today. Um, the data told us by and large that aid is not meeting people's needs for a range of reasons. Um, and it's interesting with that prioritization lens because sometimes it's because there's not enough of it, but usually it's because there's a sense in the community that it's just not been designed very well. So to put quite crudely summarizing a long report in a short sentence, it seems to be the wrong stuff provided in the wrong way and going to the wrong people. This is worsened by a lack of information um, we found clearly a huge gap in understanding about aid decisions, who gets put on lists and so on. Um, but then overall, and this came up a little bit in Andy's presentation as well, the more qualitative work we do, the more loudly we hear that a lot of people are grateful for aid efforts, but they're just massively calling for longer term solutions. So. With that as the backdrop, we ask also about participation and about accountability. Um, we used last year something called expectation confirmation theory, which was basically pulled from customer satisfaction research and is based on the premise that to understand someone's satisfaction with a service, it's quite helpful to know what they expected of that service in the first place. Um, and what was quite interesting and helpful about that was 
not so much this typical ground truth negative data that that was definitely there that showed people sort of weren't participating, didn't always know how to participate, didn't have the information they need. Um, but there was quite a high expectation around influence and participation. So people want and expect to have more influence. Um, there was a huge expectation when it came to financial transparency, understanding how decisions are made about funding, um, and all of this presumably so that they could influence aid to make some of those other metrics more positive so that precious aid money could be used better. Um, that was a very crude way of sort of describing quite a long complex report, but I think it tells quite a compelling story in the face of this need to prioritise. Um, and that it's actually not just about giving people everything that they want. Our experience shows that people's recommendations are actually quite logical and limited and humble. Um, there are some obviously bigger ticket exceptions to do with nexus issues. Of course, there are a lot of people calling for employment and often, you know, the state doesn't afford them that. Um, people might need land, etc. And that's obviously much more of an advocacy issue. But by and large, I think people are not really asking for anything outrageous, more just for aid to make sense. And I think there's a sense that their participation could help get us there. Um, so to get back to your question, because this is what I've been thinking about for a few weeks about prioritisation, I think now is probably the time when more than ever we need to make way or make the case for communities to have more influence over those big decisions like prioritisation itself. Um, we've often said at Ground Truth that in accountability we've focused a lot on activities and not on leadership. Um, maybe I'm thinking more now that I think where we have made gains in involving communities is around the edges of programming. So we've gotten better at things like feedback mechanisms, um, monitoring mechanisms that include communities, maybe consultation, but we're not necessarily involving them in the tough stuff. Um, and I think if we're worried that tough decisions will upset communities, what will be helpful is to help let them sort of make those decisions. So I think that's where we have to be going. I think that the learning that will come out of that will be immense. Um, but I just wanna end on something just inspired by the previous presentation. And I think everyone's always talking about incentives and what sort of concerns me a bit is that looking at those tier one donors from Andy's analysis, those things are not gonna get us there. So I think there needs to clearly be a bit more ambition also on the side of those writing the checks um, and I know that's a bit of a cop out because we as AAP people always love to blame donors for everything but I just sort of found that presentation quite striking um, so I'll, I'll stop there just in the interest of time. Thanks very much Meg and I'm going to get you to answer the next two questions really briefly if I may please just so that we do have time for everybody else and questions. You have a lot of access to feedback data, and as we've seen, a lot of it's quite negative, and it seems like much hasn't changed over many years. But looking at what people have told Ground Truth Solutions in recent years, and at where the system seems to be heading when it comes to AP, are there things that make you hopeful for change? Definitely. Um, and I'm sorry for having to be quick on the hopeful part and not the depressing part. Um, one of them, I think, is these flagship initiatives. And the reason for that is that they represent, as Andy sort of said, an attempt to clear some of the impediments when it comes to accountability. I think in the past, sometimes it's felt, at least to humanitarian coordinators at times, like efforts to improve AAP have actually involved piling more things on them. And that's some of the pushback that we get. Um, I'm not super hopeful that these flagship initiatives will lead to amazing change in four countries perfectly overnight, but I do think that there might be some inspiration we can take from some of the things that they're changing along the way and maybe see what sticks. Um, the second one is the nexus or the various nexuses that exist. Um, that featured in Andy's basket of issues, and I think we agree that there is this clear link between accountability and influence and longer term solutions. I'm sure Gwyn has great examples of that from her work in Bangladesh. Um, and maybe the final one is just cracking this flexible funding thing. I think OCHA is thinking through some really great stuff on this via the pooled funds. Some donors seem to be doing better than maybe they're given credit for. Um, 
And then finally, just I think some of the work that we're doing internally, a lot of others have done it a lot longer than we have, um, getting right down to the local level and trying to understand and connect better with local accountability ecosystems to try and sort of shift the power a little bit that way. Super, thanks very much, Meg. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the flagship initiative is from the Emergency Relief Coordinator and over the next three years in four countries, Colombia, Niger, South Sudan, and the Philippines, the humanitarian country teams have been given kind of a blank sheet of paper to figure out how they want to make sure accountability happens in whatever way they want to coordinate that and make sure it happens. That's the very rough and dirty version of what it is, but there is a longer document that you can look at around that. Meg, just quickly, obviously, you've been working on AAP for many years. Things have progressed a lot over time. But what do you think we really need to focus on now to make the change and make it happen? I think, again, just spurred by this prioritization obsession, um, I think we do have an opportunity to think not just about how we are encouraging participation, but on what and what level of decision. Um, I think that there is a need to do more with less. And I think if we can show that these decisions are actually being driven by community views and not that community views are coming in after the fact, um, I think that will show us a whole lot about how we can work better across the, the nexus, how we focus on this incentives question. Um, and I think it will help sort of further help us realise that AAP is kind of everything. You know, good programming is AAP, better prioritisation is AAP. Um, I have more to say, but I'll stop there so we can move on. Thanks. Thanks very much, Meg. And we've got time to come back at the end for questions. We're now going to turn to two uh, country situations that are going to be featured in the forthcoming good practices document around AAP and uh, how it's working well. So we've got Tias from IFRC Indonesia and Jerry from UNHCR in Uganda. Tias, I'm gonna ask you first, the government led and localized response to the central Sulawesi earthquake and tsunami in 2018 is gonna be featured in that forthcoming collect good practices on collective AAP. How did that collective AAP approach come about and what worked well in it that is a good example of good practice? Okay, thank you, Manisha, for the questions. Um, first of all, I just want to recall about the Sulawesi uh, earthquakes. Uh, what happened in the 2000, in September 2018? Uh, this earthquake hit the island with seven magnitudes and triggered a deadly tsunami and liquefactions. And thousands of people died and missing, and over 200,000 people were displaced. So this is a, a quite a huge um, disaster at that time. And, in the middle of this emergency response, the 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 AP, the AP collective, or uh, we call it the CE uh, community engagement working group, was established within the first uh, two weeks. Uh, this working group was initially led by the IFRC and also the Indonesian Red Cross uh, or PMI as a national societies and. Of course, also with support from the UN OCHA and also UNICEF, uh, who took technical and funding roles uh, at that time. And it was enabled by the HCT as well as a constitute the backbone of the collective approach. And uh, then we start uh, to invite other humanitarian actors who based in Sulawesi and most members of the working group were uh, local staff uh, from the local, national, international organizations. And uh, interestingly, uh, their main roles uh, who uh, participates in the working groups were not primarily in a community engagement uh, staff or AAP. Uh, they're from shelter, wash, health, care, uh, protection. So some various um, backgrounds which is great uh, so that uh, the DNA of the community engagements can be integrated within these programs. And the group was, uh, we met weekly in Palu. Uh, Palu is a capital of uh, Central Sulawesi. We share uh, any issues or problems uh, from the field that impact uh, the communities, such as uh, what's the community's feedbacks, uh, what's their questions, their complaints, their concerns, and addressing any rumors happen in the in the IDPs or within the communities. And 
we also discuss how we can respond to feedbacks, how we develop uh, the key messages from the communities, and uh, other most important was to bring uh, that to the decision makers or the governments as a part of uh, evidence-based advocacy. And as we know here that uh, during every emergencies and the uh, transition to the recovery phases, uh, the clarity of information is uh, the most priority uh, in the communities to avoid any confusion and even conflicts uh, between the government, the humanitarian actors, and also with the affected communities. And speaking of the good practices, the working groups, uh, the community engagement working group provided information and we exchanged many useful data uh, assessment reports, any research uh, related to this uh, disaster response. Uh, for instance, what the information needed by the communities during these uh, emergencies, during the transitions of the recovery phases, uh, what the communication channels preferred, uh, and who do they listen to the communities, and what's their concerns, and so on. There's um, many findings. and. Uh, so uh, we can fill the gap and increase the community's trust or acceptances uh, with the humanitarian and governments as well. Uh, I give you uh, uh, small examples uh, how uh, the the working group can also uh, have a collaborations between the the uh, the humanitarian actors. There's like uh, Indonesian Red Cross. Uh, there's a request um there's a request from the communities uh, to the indonesian red cross asking about the wheelchairs and um indonesian red cross they don't uh provide uh, the relief aid about the uh, wheelchair so we share uh this issue to the uh working groups um and we found that uh, the the other organization have a uh, focus on the disability and elderly so uh, we found uh, the the organization who can provide a wheelchair for the 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 communities, the affected communities. So uh, these collaborations, uh, this um, this working groups is very useful for uh, to fill the gaps um, and have a community trust that we come here to help. And other than that, uh, this working group also ensure why we need to listen to the communities. Some of the working groups members had a set up a feedback mechanisms using the hotlines, radio, FGDs, the communities meetings, listening groups, help desks, and even the social media platform. And from that, we uh, analyze, uh, the, the organization analyze, and uh, we find any uh, many uh, main issues in the communities. And, and to make it more effective, the community engagement working group produced a monthly bulletin. It's called uh, Suara Comunitas or Community Voices, where we compiled all the feedbacks uh, from the different channels and the organizations uh, into one uh, document. So then we distribute uh, this monthly bulletin and brought it to the governments and clusters as uh, advocacy tools. Uh, this is what happened in the in the uh, communities right now. And uh, this is what we need to raise, what we need to discuss. And uh, I remember that uh, my colleagues and I went back and forth to the governments, to the clusters, uh, to the clusters meetings, um, and sharing what we have discussed in the working group. Uh, we chasing answers from the community's questions, uh, the, the clarity, and uh, we broke again to the forum, to the working groups, uh, to the members. Uh, this is the answers and uh, this working group was finally uh, acknowledged by the secretary of the province and because they wanted to uh, to know what's the community's concerns uh, in the field so uh, then regularly we were invited to the weekly meetings uh, also to present our, and uh, we can invite them. So we have a, we built a good a relationship with the governments and the humanitarian actors in in Sulawesi, and we can invite them in an open dialogue or with the community through through the uh, Red Cross Radio Talk Show or any platforms uh, from the organization that we can conduct a two way dialogue. And yeah, I think that's how this collective approach or uh, the community engagement working groups had an important role in Sulawesi response for the governments and also for the humanitarian actors at the time.
Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much, T.S. Um, and I think that's a really great example of how you have brought the broader humanitarian community together to work with the government and really listen to people and ensure that you were able to provide the feedback and make sure their needs were reflected. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to Jerry next, and we are running short on time, so I'm going to ask you, Jerry, to be quite short, and I'll ask you the follow-up questions that I had for both of you maybe during the Q&A. But Jerry, so the Refugee Engagement Forum was set up as part of the implementation of the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework in Uganda, and the CRF was part of the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. How is the Refugee Engagement Forum a good example of putting accountability to affected populations into practice, and what can other learn, others learn from the Refugee Engagement Forum? Jerry, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Manisha. I'm really excited to talk about the Refugee Engagement Forum in Uganda. Um, for the uh, other colleagues, um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. It's evening my side. Um, the Refugee Engagement Forum uh, is a refugee participation mechanism which was designed to ensure that refugee voices are taken into account uh, in national decision making regarding refugees in the country. So uh, it effectively is uh, empowering them to be part of the process as they make decisions regarding them. Uh, I'll give a very quick snapshot about what it is so that we all understand and can really you know, draw some good lessons about uh, how we've moved and uh, how far we are going. Um, Uganda has already taken concrete steps to engage refugees, you know, to participate and influence any decision regarding them uh, at higher levels. Uh, and this comes from a backdrop that in 2017, uh, Uganda launched or established uh, what we currently call the Comprehensive Refugee Response Steering Group. Now, this is a high-level uh, group that makes decisions uh, in regarding the implementation of the Global Compact for Refugees, that's also CRF, and it is a multi-stakeholder high you know, decision-making body that comprises of government ministries, departments, agencies, UN agencies, humanitarian and government actors, uh, private sector, NGOs, and also host communities. Uh, it's important to know that in Uganda, we do use the settlement approach where refugees live alongside uh, the host community. And then, uh, so while we're doing our refugee management, we consider also the host communities. So as this meeting takes place, refugees have two seats that are reserved for them. Now, in December 2018, uh, the Office of the Prime Minister, uh, through the Department of Refugees and the and UNHCR, established the Refugee Engagement Forum. And uh, this was meant to create systematic communication between the refugee communities, and that is in the settlement, and the steering group, which is the higher uh, decision-making body regarding uh, uh, refugee matters in the country. So in this way, uh, refugees are able to advocate directly uh, to the decision-making body on issues that affect them in the settlements. So effectively, it creates that channel where they can advocate without going through intermediaries. So how is it a very good example? The Engagement Forum is now in its fifth year. Uh, we've had our uh, 17th meeting because we meet quarterly. Uh, and I'm also the co-chair to the Refugee Engagement Forum on the UNHCR side. The other co-chair is, uh, is in the OPM, that is uh, the Office of the Prime Minister, Department of Refugees. Now, um, we have been able to successfully organize these meetings where two representatives have been able to represent refugees in this body on this meeting. So, uh, in effectively, we are, all the refugees are able to directly advocate on behalf of their communities from the settlements in this coordination structure. So it's empowering them and gives them uh, the ability to voice their uh, key issues directly to all the partners and stakeholders involved in the, uh, in the refugee response. Um, we consider it a very important accountability mechanism and uh, stakeholders within the response have actually appreciated its existence because it has helped uh, you know, direct them in various ways. It has provided a space for uh, discussion and advocacy where uh, different entities within the response can come and consult and get feedback 
from refugee leaders respectively and be able to tailor their programs and uh, activities uh, to meet the demands of the refugee community. So it has really shaped our response and helped manage a lot of issues coming from the communities. Um, Manisha, I think I've kept the time. <laughs> Over to Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Jerry. I think it's an, it's actually quite a unique, uh, I think, refugee engagement forum and a really great way of having that accountability. And I was around when it first started and it's had a lot of positive feedback. So thank you for sharing that example. I will come back to both of you during the Q&A, but I want to make sure we've got time for Gwyn before we turn to the Q&A. So thank you, Tia and Jerry. Gwyn, um, who is the UN resident coordinator in Bangladesh, how is accountability to affected populations being put into practice in Bangladesh? Meg's already mentioned that you'd have a lot of things to say about it. Thanks, Malaysia. Indeed, uh, I, I think what's different about Bangladesh is that there's really two types of response that are just um, running in parallel. Um, one is obviously the, the climate response to natural disasters, Bangladesh is being the seventh most vulnerable uh, country in the world to climate change. And we've seen um, a huge number of people impacted. We did a, a study between 2014 and 2020 recently looking at the numbers. Um, and uh, about 42 million people are, were impacted by climate change during that period. So in five, six years, it's, so the numbers are, are, are quite overwhelming. Just last year, we had a flood that impacted more than 7 million people. Um, and obviously, the response in Bangladesh's government led to floods. Um, so although AAP is a key area of focus, a lot of the conversations around accountability are really with the government. Um, preparedness is a, a key area that we really need to strengthen in order to enhance the systems and the capacity. Um, and that's a big finding that we've had. And we had, a, a following the flood, a, quite an intensive AAP workshop and a number of conversations following it to, to really think through how we could have done better on the accountability side. And one of the areas that we're trying to look at is a locally led um, participatory design in terms of preparedness and what people actually want um, before before an, an emergency strikes. Um, another big finding that we had was that the, obviously it's similar to what we've already heard is around the coordination um, of the participatory needs assessments. There needs to be stronger co uh, collaboration, but one of the big sticking points and, and I think it's come out of some of the other um, sessions that you held with really around data sharing. As a system, we agree to collaborate and work together to be more accountable, but we can't share information and data across the system still. And that has been a really a big sticking point. Um, and community feedback and, um, and needs resources. In order to have an integrated feedback mechanism, you, you do need a system buy-in and you do need some investment and this is where again the donors really need to engage um, more with just to try and get a PSCA coordinator in Bangladesh it's taken a year to pull together enough funding from different bits of the system in order to get that capacity um, and that just gives you a, a kind of a sense of how challenging it is to really get these issues on the radar with all of the other competing uh, financial requirements. There needs to be more incentivization within the system in order to um, get everybody working together at a system level. I think individual organizations are working very well, but it doesn't necessarily come together um, when we're dealing with natural disasters and preparedness. The, the other area I just want to touch on very briefly because it's so different is the Rohingya response to the development of refugees. Um, when we're losing you a little bit, can you maybe uh, speak a little bit closer? Sure. Thank you. And, and maybe also for those in the, the technicians, could you maybe put the transcript on? Because then we can also, it's actually picking you up better than we can sometimes hear you. Sorry about that. No, no problem. The other, the other uh, area I wanted to touch on briefly is the Rohingya response. It's close to a million refugees in Bangladesh. And that it's purely humanitarian led. And it's a very different uh, a very different approach in terms of AAP because we have some very, very strong organizations. We have, you know, very strong... Uh, local NGOs and national NGO BRAC, COAST, as well as a lot of the agencies working on AAP. So that's been very um, uh, more traditional in a sense, um, but we haven't seen the systematic engagement uh, of AAP since the beginning of the response. We've been strong on uh, community communication work. We've been strong in engaging volunteers to, to do some of the feedback, and that's been very, very positive. 
and um, we've worked with women in child-friendly spaces. That's also been very positive. But having a systemic or a systematic way of working across the system has been missing. Um, and again, I think very recently we really illustrated some of the challenges to our overall humanitarian system. We've had to make a ration cut to the refugees from $12 down to 10. Um, and there was no consultation with the communities. Um, and because it's, it's around funding and because our funding is very siloed. So I think these are just some of the areas that we've been trying to work on. And I think a lot of them reflect what some of the, the speakers have already talked about in terms of some of the systemic challenges we're facing. Thanks very much, Gwen. Um, I don't think we've been able to get the captions up. If, if you could stick the captions up, I think it'll be easier because it sounds not great. Apologies for that, Gwen. But I think it, it, just to give a, a few highlights in case people in the room didn't hear, I think talking about the two different types of responses to climate response with over 42 million impacted over five to six years and the need to really work together, bring in the views of populations early on to make sure that they're part of preparedness design, but the fact that you also, and also the need for data sharing early on, but the challenge of not having enough investment is one of the big challenges there. And in the Rohingya response as well, working together, but again, that need for investment so that we're able to work as a community. So thank you, Gwen, for that. And we do have captions up. So hopefully now when I ask you the next question, people in the room will be able to also follow along because the sound's not so great. Um, given that you've been involved with when the IISC, the Interagency Standing Committee principles, first made commitments around accountability to affected populations, Gwen, what do you think's changed since then to better enable AAP and what still needs to change so that we can put those commitments that have been made at the highest levels into practice? I, th I think it's already been said, uh, Manisha, where, where we're now, where, where we really no longer dealing with whether or not we have to look at AAP, but we're much more talking about how we implement. And um, there is an acknowledgement system-wide that we do need to change behavior. Um, we do, we have acknowledged that um, we need to give people choices and choices equate with dignity. And I think that's a huge achievement that the system has made. Um, and at the time when we were talking about this, um, a lot of the work had been done in the NGO community and we were trying to bring that learning to the UN. And there was a lot of conversations about whether it was relevant for the United Nations in the same way, if we had to change the standards. So the fact that we're not having those conversations anymore and that it is something that people understand, I think has, has, has been a very positive shift. Um, I think this, the big challenge is that the system is still not set up for us to be collectively accountable. We're made up of separate agencies, separate NGOs with different mandates, and we're quite um, fragmented. And I think there's a very inherent disincentive within the system still for us not to be collectively accountable. If one agency doesn't know how much another agency is getting funded, and they don't know what their programs are, how can we be accountable to the people we serve? And that comes back to this prioritization issue that we're all now facing. Um, we really do need to have not only um, consistent and predictable funding, as Andy has said, but we need to understand where the funding is going. We need greater transparency. So when a big funding cut is facing a community that they can actually decide and we can't say, oh, we, don't, we don't reply, oh, sorry, that funding is earmarked and there's nothing we can do about it because ultimately that's what we always end up saying. And I think there's still a lot of fragmentation and there's a lot of silos. I think a, a key role that we need to uh, focus on in terms of the development partners and some colleagues talked about the nexus is really breaking down some of the conversations with government, talking to them about what we mean by accountability and getting their buy-in because it's not adequate to only have it in the response. It really needs to be part of the broader preparedness work that we're doing and the capacity development uh, work that we're doing across systems and institutions. Um, data sharing is key. Um, we don't have proper data systems still. Um, we don't have proper response uh, information systems that are rolled out systematically. Um, and I think frontline staff need to be empowered. We still are working with colleagues who may be told that they need to consult, but I'm not sure even the frontline staff when they go back to their um, organizations are necessarily being listened to. So localization is also critical. 
I could go on, but I think I'll stop there in the in the interest of time. Thanks, Manisha. Thanks so much, Gwen. And I think you touched upon a lot of the issues that came out in our earlier sessions uh, during HMPW last week in terms of working with frontline staff, the localization elements, the fact that we're still quite siloed in the system and there's fragmentation, we don't have the transparency, which is really required for accountability and that need for data sharing systems so that we've got the information. But it also comes down to that the disincentives that are there and the, the fact that we have a competitive system also, Andy, as you mentioned earlier on. So I think there's been a lot of kind of similarities in what's been said across the speakers. So thank you to all our panelists. We do have time now for questions. I'm going to take a couple from online before I turn to those in the room. So please put your hands up and I will come to you. Um, there had been a question in online in terms um, of... Uh, now I've lost it, sorry. Uh, I'm going to find another one to ask one second. Um, what is the accountability of governments? And I think when you also pointed out that we need to bring governments in much more and understand what accountability means for them, uh, the question that had been submitted earlier was that the primary accountability lies with governments, not with humanitarian agencies. So I guess linked to that question about donors and hosting governments as well, you know, where is the accountability there and what can we do about that? So also bringing in that nexus element and a question that had been asked similar to that on the chat was around, are there AAP working groups that bring together development and humanitarian and peace actors so that you've got that nexus element there at the same time? And if so, how do these groups work, particularly when it comes to aspects of complaints? I'm just taking a few so that I can throw it back to all of the panelists in terms of those of you who might have ideas uh, of how to answer. And are there good examples of pivoting programs to respond to community feedback? Because that's one of the effective things that we've said is we get feedback, but then how do we change our programs? I'm going to stop with those ones and maybe turn to the panel. Actually, no, I'll take a couple from the room as well. Jesse, I saw you. Just introduce yourself, please, if you're in the room. Yeah. Thanks, Manisha. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Jesse Wood. I'm um, one of the co-chairs, along with Tanya and Frank, of the task force uh, from WFP. I just want to, again, thank all the panelists uh, for the amazing presentation today, the rich, the rich information that's come out. Uh, I had wanted to take a chance to ask a question. It's in follow-up to an opportunity that the task force had had to present to the Good Humanitarian Donorship Group, um, who had invited us to discuss the issue of how they can help us address and, and improve collective accountability. And I think a lot of the issues, of course, that Andy raised around you know, flexibility, certainty, um, incentives, et cetera, were very relevant and germane. Um, but they really were looking for guidance on, okay, so we agree with this, all these in principle, but what do we do to help you break down the silos, to actually make the investments in collective accountability? I think as uh, Gwyneth was just talking about, or Gwen, sorry, in Bangladesh, the sentiment is there. There's, we're sort of at this tipping point where there's broad understanding of, of why the issue is important. Generally, what we have to do but then the mechanics don't necessarily support us to actually get it done. So um, any thoughts from the panelists on, you know, how donors could use their weight uh, and their money in a way that doesn't necessarily earmark and constrain us, but does make sure that we're getting the collective systems in place that we need uh, to really deliver on the collective accountability agenda. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Jesse. Maybe I'll stop with those and I'll come to others in the audience on the second round, just so we can get some answers from the panel. I don't know, Andy, if you want to go first, because there was a lot of the donor elements there. And then I'll turn to those online and you, Tanya, as well. If you Thanks want. very much. Um, I think specifically on the question um, coming out of the opportunity with a good humanitarian donorship initiative, it's something that struck me as um, I was looking through the, the different recommendations and the different approaches, commitments, requirements of the donors. And something that does come across very strongly is that whilst on the one hand, people look at the humanitarian system and say it's quite chaotic and is it a collective system, it's competitive. But in a similar way, in a way, there's a bit of mere culpa for the donors as well, I do think. And some of the, the language that the GHD um, use is a little bit sort of outdated and potentially could um, be, it would benefit from being 
kind of revised so it's more in line with where the system's at now. But most importantly, is that there's certainly scope for donors to be much clearer themselves in how they coordinate um, in an operational perspective, where there is now clarity around what the services and responsibilities are, and it's almost incumbent upon them to do more in a way to be clear about how they're going to um, fund those those different services, I think. So that came out quite quite strongly from the research. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, those online, any sort of uh, thoughts around the role of government and accountability or how you can pivot in terms of programs to respond to community feedback? Or the other one around Nexus uh, groupings around AAP. Anybody have any thoughts? I'll let you unmute yourselves because I don't see any hands if there's anybody who's got an answer. I can maybe come in on the um, on the AAP working group one. I think it's an excellent idea. I've never seen it. Um, there's been a couple of countries where we have inquired about whether or not that's possible and a couple of um actually donors have basically said this is way too hard already just with humanitarian actors don't make us make it broader um but i think that that would be a really helpful way to bridge some of these divides is if community feedback and community views were actually the starting point across both um and maybe just quickly on this donor question, um, I mean, I think that sometimes donors are also thinking about AAP in this really limited way. Like I think there's a lot they could be doing to, for example, you know, support area-based approaches, unearmark the funds like Gwyn was talking about, um, not just allow pivots, but actually encourage them. I think that's something that often they don't do even if they sort of say that it's allowed. Um, and also, I think just in some instances, diversifying funding a little bit from, you know, the humanitarian oligarchy and sort of looking at, you know, are there actually more diversified places where this funding could end up that are a bit closer to communities and are a little bit more agile and able to sort of pivot without jumping through as many hoops as some of the big agencies sort of have to. Um, I think just quickly on the government side, I don't have a huge answer to that. We've sometimes definitely struggled on our side to win support from for our work from certain governments who see it as quite threatening, who sort of say, you know, particularly this word accountability, sometimes we have to sort of frame it in a different way. Um, We've just done some climate change work actually in Bangladesh um, and we were working with an organisation called ICAD led by Salim Huck, who was sort of a big voice on climate from Bangladesh. Um, and he was very clear with us from the outset that that work is really important, but that it has to focus on government accountability to the population. And it has to be about the population sort of realising that any work that happens under the banner of climate change or response to climate disasters is the responsibility of that government. Um, I think that was a sentiment that for us was really refreshing because we're always being told to sort of focus on the opposite. Um, but I will say that he didn't necessarily give us a great roadmap as to how to get there without getting thrown out of the country. So I don't have, don't have a lot of solutions on that one, unfortunately. Thanks very much, Meg. Uh, Gwen, T.S. or Jerry, any thoughts on those questions? Yeah, and maybe I can add, add to that. The, the, the role of the government is key, and, and uh, most responses now, particularly when we're talking natural disasters, the government is obviously in the lead, and, and particularly given the scale. And um, what we're able to do is, is a, a drop in the ocean in comparison. Um, and a, a lot of it can be done in a kind of a softer way. I think it's, it's really about the community engagement beforehand um, and, and having conversations with government about that feedback, not necessarily calling it the big A word because it's very difficult to explain. Number one is, is, is in my experience in Bangladesh, and it is quite threatening because the government is, is concerned that we're asking them to be accountable somehow to us as well. So some of those conversations are quite difficult. Um, but it really is important to do because unless we get it right, and we, we just keep on falling into the same um, the same pattern um, and, and uh, trying to 
uh, be accountable when in actual fact accountability really requires trust and it's something that you build over time. It's not something that's easy to do very quickly in an emergency response. I think it's, it's, it's really uh, at the basis of it. Um, uh, it is, it is um, uh, something that I think the donors can also do better. I can say that I doubt the donors in Bangladesh, since I've been here at least, have spoken about accountability in any of the donor coordination groups. Um, uh, and so having G GHD encourage donor coordination uh, groups to have those conversations would be, I think, a really important start, because I'm not sure that that's something that's happening across the board in every country. Um, uh, because I, there's a lot of pressure on, on, on the, the operational agencies to do it, but it's not necessarily something that the donors take on themselves to, to, to have conversations about. So I think that would be that would be very interesting, just a very practical um, way of... of um, when, when we've lost you a little bit, can you just speak closer to your computer, please? Um, Manisha, I was just, just saying, I think it'd be very useful to have donors talk about their own accountability and uh, within the system as well because i don't think those conversations happen very often super thanks so much and i think that idea of really making sure that it's not just the donors talking about aap but that they're talking about it with the government as well is really essential on that point about building trust in advance of an emergency is really coming back again to that point around the nexus and bringing development and humanitarian actors into the room, even if it is difficult, as as you said, Meg. Jerry or Tias, did you want to come in before we do a quick second round of questions? Nothing. Uh, it's all good. It's all great. Thank you. No. Okay. Great. We'll do another round of questions and then come back to the panelists for a last thing. I've got two in the room. I'm going to start with Alan at the back and then come to you, please. Please introduce yourselves. Yes, uh, Alan Kalma from the Lutheran World Federation. Um, thank you for the inputs. I was madly writing notes and tweeting at the same time because there's so many things to catch in that one. Um, but I think it's it's quite a timely discussion. Like after all these years, we're still talking about AAP, but at least it's moving a little bit. And I'm I'm sort of like you know at least there's hope that there's some changes in between. But I really like what uh, Meg was sort of like saying in terms of. We've gotten better in involving the communities that we support in terms of decision making, but we still shy away from involving them when it comes to tough decisions or key decisions. And unless we sort of start facing that, um, nothing really will change because we'll still keep the decision to us, the decision making power. So my question, I guess, is more on, I know there's been some progress, like, but what more can we do to sort of like improve on that because you can't just expect them to sit on the table and make these decisions in an appropriate way they need to be more informed we get them more informed now the more they know about our roles and responsibilities and the standards um, they can engage more but what more are we not doing to ensure that we're equipping the communities that we serve to be better or to be more engaged um, or actually to demand that they become part of that actual you know, decision-making when it comes to more tougher and more key decisions. Thanks, over. Thank you very much, Alan. And then in the front row, please. Hi, I'm Stane from Internews. Um, I'll try to be brief. I think I've got one radical and one pragmatic comment, and I'll end with a very simple question. As long as you keep the comments quick, please. Yeah. I think one radical one is that I hear a lot about efficiency and dignity. And when we talk about sticks, we talk about whether you have a feedback mechanism or not. And I think that suits us quite well because nobody's against any of those things. And I think we have to talk about accountability that it also can hurt. Like what are the consequences and when does it actually become uncomfortable at times when something goes wrong? What are the consequences? Um, the pragmatic part of it is, is actually that we can, um, we're very welcoming, you know, the flagship initiative and further reforms and all of that. But like, mm -hmm. I think what stops us from right now being more approachable, what stops us from right now communicating better how decisions are being made to indeed have a better management of expectations and a more meaningful engagement of the communities because they actually know what is possible and therefore what they can, uh, you know, get involved with. So what is stopping us now from doing that? Sorry, did you introduce yourself at the beginning? I missed it. Stay in internews. Thank you. 
Um, super. Thank you very much. And there's a couple of questions online that I'll just throw out there as well, just in case they're helpful for the panelists in terms of other questions to answer. Um, how do we move beyond a tick box exercise, knowing that there's lots of hundreds of entities that need to be held accountable for different duties and obligations? And how do we make sure that that information, as you mentioned before, Alan, is accessible to people um, with disabilities or otherwise so that we can reinforce accountability from the beginning? Maybe TS and Jerry, I can turn to you in terms of, you know, what are what can we do better in terms of the, making those tough decisions and involving people from the beginning and how do we make sure that we can be more inclusive of them? And if I can turn to you for those questions, please, sorry. Maybe Tia's first and then Jerry, and then I'll come to Gwyn and Megan, Andy. Okay, thank you, Manisa. Um, yeah, I think to 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 put the uh, the communities, the vulnerable uh, communities in the beginning of this uh, response or in the working groups is uh, also the most important to listen more and more but um it's it's an, it's not uh, easy that uh, we can include uh, the vulnerable people or in the uh, people giving the access for for the elderly for the disabilities uh, to our uh, to the informations uh, that we want to uh, provide to them so um, I think the 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 organizations itself, the leaderships, uh, should be involved uh, from the beginnings as well, uh, from the assessment, from the plannings, uh, to to ensure that um, those inclusions, uh, those uh, participations of the of the uh, community groups, uh, different community groups. Uh, should be included uh, from the beginnings and not only from the beginnings but also from the implementation from the evaluations and uh, report and back to the uh, assessments again um, and giving them uh, the access of the informations um, is not a one-way uh, so not a one-way uh, communications for them but giving them uh, provide uh, what's the best uh, communication channels uh, to them. Uh, for example, so giving the assessment, asking the, the as much as uh, the, uh, the community groups, different groups, um, the questions about how the information they need, or what's the communication channels they uh, prefer, so how the comfort way uh, they want to open the dialogue so they can be uh, open and feel dignity and respect uh, during this emergency response. So they can be um, uh, speak to us uh, about what they need, and uh, we as a humanitarian actors can be accountable and listen uh, to the to these communities um, for the whole uh, operations and integrating from the integrating their feedbacks uh, to the uh, program adaptations and for the improvements as well. Thanks very much, TS. Jerry, did you have any thoughts on that in terms of also how do we make sure that we're involving them in the decision making and making those yeah, tough yes. decisions? Yeah, thank you, uh, Malaysia. Well, involving, uh, you know, um, our persons of concern in these tough decisions uh, is quite challenging. And uh, I must say, um, in the Ugandan operation, currently, you know, we're going through food reprioritization. And that's a very tough decision, both on uh, humanitarian, development workers, and, uh, you know, the UN itself, because it directly affects uh, the livelihoods and uh, self-reliance of uh, refugees that are living within the settlement system. So in other words, um, we're trying to say that the refugees have to be more self-reliant to be able to survive. Um, the Refugee Engagement Forum has provided uh, a platform and a system where all development uh, uh, entities or humanitarian workers can effectively consult from the highest to the lowest level. So um, in, in a way that making some of these tough de decisions really doesn't have to be very difficult for uh, uh, for, for the uh, partners involved in the refugee response. Mm -hmm. So uh, through the feedback, referral, and response mechanism that's already instituted within the refugee response, uh, persons of concern can be able to consult and also get information. But we've also taken a further step to equip um, the, the, the refugee engagement forum members who are currently 37 in number and represent 30 
13 settlements in the country. So these leaders are taken through a series of capacity building to be able to advocate actively uh, for uh, and to be part of these key decisions. But also, as I said, um, the uh, part of the you know the platform where some of these hard decisions are made. I must say that even during the prioritization process, uh, there was a lot of back and forth consultation from the grassroots that is at village level within the settlements up to the national level, including everybody within the system. And because we're able to get a number of complaints from the settlements, uh, we had to set up a system where um, the, the, the uh, persons of concern can go and complain and be able to be given feedback. So we have a rebuttal system where you can be able to complain and, you know, if you put a, you, you're put in a lower, say, uh, receiving category, you should be able to be uplifted in case of your vulnerability. But also we have carried out uh, participatory assessments uh, to look at the vulnerability levels of uh, all the uh, persons of concern before some of these hard decisions are made. So it has to be a very proactive uh, approach involving all the uh, persons of concern, uh, actors within the, within the refugee response, and making government in the lead because government in Uganda is in charge of the refugee management. So it has to make the final decision whether this goes through or not. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jerry. And I think that final point there is particularly one to think about is that the decision making of government also plays a really critical role, not just of individuals who are affected by crisis. Gwen, did you have thoughts on these kind of how do we bring them in for those tough decisions? As you said earlier, you know, when the rations were cut in the refugee camps, were they part of those decisions? Uh, we can't hear you, Gwen. Oh, there we go. Start again, please. Yeah, at a programmatic level, yes. So if, if you're talking about uh, the food program um, and the one program that's been cut, yes. But um, I think at a system level, the conversation should be, here are all the services, and um, this is the amount of money we have. Um, what would the community like to see given the terrible circumstances that we're facing? And we're not able as a system to have that conversation. And I think that's the challenge because there isn't a common funding mechanism, then there isn't an integrated response in the full sense. We're doing what we can with disparate actors. So I think that's a challenge. Um, uh, the other colleague asked what's stopping us. I don't think, uh, I think there's huge efforts being made. I don't think it's a question of being uh, people stopping us or, or, or not moving forward. I think we are moving forward on these issues, but I think the bigger the bigger questions and the more um, critical questions still require us to address key bottlenecks in the system if we're going to be able to be fully accountable to, to people. Super, thank you very much, Gwen. I, we've only got four minutes left. I just wanted to see if anybody had like a, a one minute response they wanted to give in terms of what needs to change or that we haven't covered yet. Meg, maybe then Andy, and then Jerry, Tyus, and Gwen. And then Tanya, if you wanted to as well. 30 seconds. Great, thanks. I think someone talked to someone that asked the question about how do we move away from a tick box approach. Um, and one issue that we haven't talked much about is leadership and it's leadership at every single level. And I think that's the point at which we really start to make change. And so we have seen some encouraging progress. We have seen humanitarian leaders at different levels make a strong commitment. There's still work that can be done though. And that needs to be replicated at every level, agency level. Um, ERC has made a strong uh, uh, um, commitment, country level. Um, so, so I think that's what will really sort of role model that change that needs to happen in AOP. Wonderful. Thank you. Meg, in 30 seconds, please. I'm going to answer Steen's question with something that I stole from him, but I think um, I think transparency is a really big one. Like you can't expect people to participate if they have no idea what's going on. And so I feel like in a lot of discussions we have that comes up and no one is really cracking how to do that in a way that they feel is sort of effective or safe enough. Maybe there's some inspiration we can take from Jerry, um, but I think that is a, a huge roadblock. Wonderful. Thank you, Meg. Jerry, please. Yeah, yes, thank you, uh, Manisha. Um, well, on my side, I would think what needs to improve is, uh, you know, the level of inclusivity. Uh, as much as we're trying so much to, uh, you know, enable the refugees, you know, have a voice, 
we also make, need to make sure that the uh, persons with a disability are taken into consideration are the more vulnerable persons. And also taking into account that uh, we are having a very fluid refugee emergency situation where we're having influxes that are coming in and then we're having new arrivals. So uh, we need to create uh, you know, a method or a way we can raise awareness and make sure that everybody who comes in or every person of concern is aware about this system. So basically, inclusivity is key for me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jerry. T.S., your thoughts in 30 seconds, please. Thank you. I think I agree that uh, the leadership buy-in in the AP or the community engagement itself, so the senior management um, in every level uh, should be convinced and understands that this approach is not only for the technical programs, but also beyond. It could be a benefit for the organization's reputation, donor trust, the program's impacts, um, and so on. So. Uh, we find a better way to keep integrating this approach um, into the systems in the whole part of the operation holistically. Thank you. Thanks very much, T.S. Gwyn, please. For me, I think it's uh, trust. It's, it's uh, taking the time to build the trust, uh, you know, prior, prior to the prior to a disaster happening, if possible. Um, but also just making, starting with the small decisions and building up so when the difficult ones come, there is trust within the system and, and people understand uh, clearly what's happening. I think it, it's not easy to do it quickly um, and I think we, we need to be more sy systematic about our approach. Super, thank you so much. And huge thanks to all of our panelists. I think we've covered a huge amount of topics. We've definitely made progress over the years, but there's still a lot of work that we need to be doing. And it started, as Tanya said at the beginning, about leadership and inclu inclusivity and making sure that we're able to influence those who hold power. And I think we came back to that at the end as well, but also that need for transparency, for making sure that we're building the trust, involving, involving leadership throughout from the beginning, but really also thinking about how do we make sure that donors are able to support with predictable and flexible funding, that they're engaging not only amongst donors themselves, but also with governments, because in the end, governments also have a big role in terms of decision making. And their leadership is also key in many responses, particularly in disasters. We need to find a way to make sure that people have a role and that they're making those decisions with, with us, not just on a programmatic level, but even those more systematic tough ones when it comes to prioritization. And fundamentally, that really means that the system does need to shift from a supply-driven one to a demand-driven one, which then does require us to deal with some of those issues that Gwen raised about not being so siloed in our approaches, really trying to find ways to move past so those inherent disincentives that are there. We need that greater transparency across organizations so that we know what we're doing in terms of programming, comes back again to what was discussed last week. We need better systems for data sharing so that we're able to have the proper systems that we're engaging our frontline staff and making sure that we're there and that we're really able to break down some of those silos so that we're not leaving people just listening and not that we're just listening to people, but that we're really including them in the decision-making and the ways forward. Huge thanks to our, pet Tanya, I forgot to come to you for a last word. <laughs> Tanya was Tanya was here. She wasn't just actually as an original panelist. She was dragged in at the last minute. I don't know if you well, wanted to, to be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, just I think on behalf of as well on behalf of the the task force. I think one of the points that I think has come out of this session, in addition to what you summed up so amazingly well, Manisha. But this is move from community engagement, participation. The tough challenge on the table, though, is the term accountability. Um, Meg wrote a great article in the New Humanitarian recently about you can't have accountability without regulation. And we do. If we're talking about accountability, we do need sanctions. So to that point around, it's not only, of course, the trust building and the communication and the participation, but that is why it's so fundamental that we do look at leadership. We do look at the engagement of the power that local governments have and why we need to bring the, the donors in, because we do need to shift the conversation to one that is fundamentally about accountability. Super. Thank you very much, Tanya. So finally, just a huge thanks to all of our panelists, to Andy, Jerry, T.S., Meg, and Gwyn, especially Gwyn and Meg, who are joining us, uh, and T.S., you're, uh, you're all joining us very late in your evening. So thank you so much for that. 
Also to Rachel from the IAC Secretariat who helped organize the panel and get us speakers. So really appreciate that, Rachel. Um, also to PHAP, all the colleagues there, technicians in the room, thank you. To all of you online and in the room, huge thanks to you as well. We do have the recordings of all six sessions, or we will have all this one as well, available on the PHAP website. So there's the link. You can get them all. This one will go up quickly, as well as the answers to the questions that were in the sessions as well. So once again, thank you to everyone and also to the IASC task force supported by UNICEF, who's been leading these AAP sessions for ha helping us organize this. And apologize, apologies for being a few minutes late, but thank you very much for your patience. And I wish you all a great end of your day. Thank you. Thank you.